Playwright will wait for everything. You don't have to set timeouts. It gets done for you. And that makes it really easy because you just have to concentrate on writing a test and not having to think about all the setup. This is encroaching on my trademark sleep method that I add to every test. <laughs> <laughs> This episode is brought to you by our friends at Square. Develop on the platform that sellers trust. Here's what you could do with Square. You could bridge more experiences. You could build online, mobile, and in-person commerce experiences that connect more customers and sellers. You can build custom booking solutions. You can create and track orders. You can accept payments. You can manage and curate inventory. You can organize customers. You can manage employees. You can extend Square gift cards to your app. You can use Afterpay. And all this is powered by the world-class Square API and SDKs that enable you to build full featured business apps for yourself or millions of Square sellers. So much is available as a Square Solutions partner. Learn more and get started at changelog.com slash square. Again, changelog.com slash square. This is JS Party your weekly celebration of JavaScript and the web. Changelog has joined the Fediverse. Find our Mastodon instance at changelog.social and connect with us at jsparty at changelog.social. Thanks to our partners at Fastly for delivering our pods super fast all around the world. Check them out at fastly.com. And to our friends at fly.io, deploy your app servers close to your users, no ops required. Learn more at fly.io. Okay, it's party time, y'all. Hello, JS Party listeners. This is Amel here today. I've got a very special show. We've got Nick Nisi on the show with me today. Hello, Nick. Hoi hoi. How's it going, Amel? It's going. I'm in Mexico, and so I apologize for any audio awkwardness team or team. Uh, I'm so used to talking to my workmates. So sorry for any <laughs> audio awkwardness, listeners. You are really my team, just like an extended JS family team, right? So apologize for that. But we've got Debbie O'Brien on the show with us today. Welcome, Debbie. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Yes, we're so excited to have you. Thank you so much for finally coming on. Uh, I shouldn't say finally, but I feel like we've wanted to have a show about playwright and it's like been on mm-hmm. like our heads forever. And then we finally got our act together enough to you know ask you to come on the show. So thank you for coming. So Debbie, um, I already spilled the beans about playwright. I guess that's what the show today is about. <laughs> Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So yeah, my name is Debbie O'Brien. I'm Irish, but I live in Mallorca and I work for Microsoft as a senior program manager with a focus on advocating for Playwright. So basically helping to build a community, making sure that everybody in the world knows about Playwright and loves Playwright and gets to use it and uh, basically just, yeah, build that community up. So that's what I'm basically involved in. I don't know how far, how much more you want to know about me. I go running around the island of Mallorca and cycling and spend three hours a day doing sport and you know. <laughs> I want to ask you a really like, please don't judge me question, which is where is Mallorca? Go for it. <laughs> and then also tell us about what was life before Microsoft? How did you end up there? What were you doing? Sure. So Mallorca is a very small island. If you've heard of Barcelona in Spain, you just go across the water. Many people have heard of Ibiza. Ibiza is the smaller island of the Balearic Islands. So I could basically cycle around the island in a day, be a good couple of hundred kilometers, but it's I've done it. Yeah, so before Microsoft, I was working a lot with open source. I worked at a company previously called Bit. Uh, it's a company about components. And before that, I was working at Nuxt. You might have heard of Nuxt as in the meta framework on top of you. And then before that, I was working at agencies and other kind of small companies here on the island of Mallorca, mainly in the hotel industry, because that's kind of what this island has, right? It's all tourism. Yeah. So yeah, it was... A lot of fun, very involved in the front end. When I worked at the agencies, for example, my mission was to create like really good websites for hotel chains and try and make sure there was great performance, add testing, teach their developers how to have better code. So I was constantly fighting for developers to to do testing, right? And then I always had like managers saying, no, we have no money. We're not 
just remove the testing and <laughs> we'll sell it at this price and we don't need to do testing. And I'm like, ah, oh. so yeah, very frustrating. So it's nice to actually work now in Playwright and, and force testing on the world. <laughs> yeah, you're amongst your people. So yeah, but it's about making testing easier, right? It really is. Yeah. Now you're not only amongst your people, you're actually part of helping shape that story for developers, right? Who are your customers in this case. Yeah. Yeah. So first of all, Playwright is like, I feel like it's like 1960 and the Beatles have come out with, I don't know, their second album or third album. And <laughs> it just feels like Microsoft just keeps coming. I wasn't alive then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, neither was I, in all fairness. But, you know, the point is, like, I don't know. It's, like, one hit after another in terms of, like, large-scale open source projects that are gaining a ton of adoption. Uh, I was just looking at the GitHub page this morning. 44,000, like, you know, stars. That's huge. 44,000 stars is huge. Mm -hmm. And we want more. So keep, you know, if you haven't starred us, star us, because we love stars. We live by stars. Uh, if we don't get stars, we don't get paid. So make sure you give us stars. <laughs> <laughs> they get paid in stars. You heard it here first. <laughs> we get paid in stars, yes. <laughs> so besides getting paid in stars, what is Playwright? Can you give us, just tell us what is Playwright in your own words and for mm -hmm. some of our listeners who may have, you know, not been uh, familiar with this project as well. Never heard of it. Yeah, never heard of it. Sure, yeah. So everyone should have heard of Playwright. If not, then, you know, you're not following me. <laughs> no, seriously. So Playwright is about getting end-to-end -end testing, automated end-to-end -end testing on the browser. So you have a website, for example, and I don't know if you ever worked in the front-end world where you manually tested your application, as in you opened up a form and you manually filled out that form, pressed the send button, and then you saw there was an error and you went and fixed it, and then you manually went back and started doing it again and found another error. And this is time-consuming, right? Is there any other way to test? <laughs> there wasn't at the time, <laughs> but now. <laughs> it's like, why are you encroaching in my job? Okay, hashtag job security. <laughs> but it is actually like, I live very much on the edge of technology, right? And I live in like, in the world that not everyone lives in, which is I do everything that's like out there, that's new and shiny, but not everyone is. And I spoke to developers at conferences who are still manually testing their application, who are still manually filling in that form. And we need to stop and let those people have a better life because they don't realize that there is an alternative and it's going to make their yes. life easier. So by automating your tests, basically you write that test and then every time you run that test, the playwright or the test is going to actually fill everything in for you so you don't have to manually do it. And computers are much faster than us at the end of the day, right? So it's going to get done so much faster and then you're going to find out that error, you're able to fix it and then take your whole application, a massive application, it's impossible for you to manually test your whole application, right? So automating your tests, that's basically what Playwright is about. You do that, writing tests is gonna be easier, testing your application is gonna be easier. And I think for me personally, it's about trying to get developers to write tests because there's a, there's a big thing, right? We hate tests, we don't wanna do tests, we don't have time to test. And trying to get that stigma away and change the culture so that actually people do tests as part of their development phase, because then you can walk away on a Friday happy with your code, knowing, you know what, my code is good because I test it and I know it's good and I can spend my weekends feeling good knowing on Monday I'm not going to have any problems. <laughs> the dream. Yeah, no, I mean, absolutely. And the way you're talking about Playwright, first of all, I have like a different understanding of the name Playwright now. I'm like, thank you for helping me kind of see the light on that. You know, it's the Playwright. I get it. It's like the, it's the thing that like runs and, you know. The person who writes the play. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I always assumed that the name Playwright kind of came from its origin, like Playwright itself and its origin, which does have some history with another project, right? Called Puppeteer. Yeah. Is that kind of a, a play on that project? Oh. It is as well. Yeah. So, yeah. So basically, Puppeteer, like the puppet master, right? Who, yeah. you know, makes the yeah. puppets do all the work. <laughs> and then Playwright started as a fork of Puppeteer. But the creator of Puppeteer is working on Playwright, right? So that fork then went to a completely different direction, like all forks mm -hmm. in the road. They, they are very close together and then they just go completely different, right? Mm -hmm. Then Playwright is the person who writes the plays and the play uses the puppet master to do the, you know, so it's kind of like we're above on top of that, like <laughs> putting it all together, right? <laughs> yeah, I really like that. 
Yeah. And so I have to ask, because I know our listeners are, are going to, are also curious about this as well. This project was forked from Puppeteer. So what was the driving factor for that or versus kind of just contributing to the same open source project? Because I think one of the things we hear often about open source is like the benefit is, you know, you can carry your resume around with you, right? And then you can kind of continue to work on stuff regardless of where you're working. So was it like, hey, we want to add certain features and like we want to take it the project in a different direction? Is that kind of the driving factor? Yeah, I don't have all the details because I wasn't part of the team at the time. But at the time, the team were in Google working on Puppeteer and Puppeteer was open sourced. But Puppeteer was made for what Puppeteer was made for, right? And Microsoft wanted to invest in testing and they needed a team to help build something because of we have a, a problem in the industry when it comes to testing. We don't have a lot of amazing solutions out there. So it made sense to find amazing people who already have experience in automation, right? But now you've got to take, you've got to start with something. So you start with a, a fork of Puppeteer, but Puppeteer wasn't made for testing, right? So that's why it has some problems if you're going to do testing, right? But because the person who created Puppeteer is working on Playwright, you take that fork, you know the code, it's your code, you built it. So it's easy to modify it, to do what you wanted to do, to build on it which is how Playwright has grown so fast because it has that strong core, a solid base and a very strong team as well that have been working together already for many years and were able to, you know, build Playwright to do exactly what, what it was required to do, which is automated testing, browser testing. Wow. Now that's like super neat. And so like, what do you see as like the unique value props that Playwright kind of brings to the table? Like what is it uniquely bringing to the table where it kind of shines above the rest in your opinion? I think there's so much, and that's the kind of cool thing, right? So first of all, very simply, you've got being able to test across multiple browsers. So even if you're on a Windows computer, you can test Safari, right? It'll just run all your tests on any of those, also emulating your mobile devices. It's not the same as a mobile device, but it's a very good emulation. So you can now test against mobile Safari, etc. Then you've got tests running in parallel which means it's super fast and mm. we don't have time, right? We want to get things done. We want our tests to just run super fast. If you run them all in parallel, obviously it's going to run much faster because that means, you know, they're all running when they're ready to run. It's like, I'm not even explaining that really very well, but um, it doesn't have to wait for the other yeah. one to finish. Yeah, no, it's maximizing compute. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So you don't have to like have that coffee break for 20 minutes and wait for the test to pass and then come back, right? <laughs> That's really cool. I didn't actually know that it, uh, or I didn't realize maybe that it ran things in parallel or that it could. I've used Playwright before yeah. for testing and I always used it in headless mode. So I never really like, I guess, acknowledged that, but it probably was. Watched it. Yeah. 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 If you do do it in non-headless mode or in headed mode, I guess, does it just pop up several windows and kind of show you everything happening all at once? Yeah, but I would say the best way to really kind of see it in action is to use the mm -hmm. VS Code extension. And if you open the example to do app that comes with it, so that's got a load of tests in the one file. Yeah. And you'll see it kind of start maybe on test one, and then you'll see maybe test six will run, and then test three will run. And it's all in different kind of orders. And it's just like oh, cool. going really fast as opposed to going one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. That's probably the best way to see it because you can actually like go, oh, I can see what's going on, right? Yeah. Yeah, but talk about like having something that forces your tests to not reuse state and have like forcing them to be sandboxed. I think the, the first project in the JavaScript community to do that type of tests run in parallel and at random was Ava. And that was kind of a headless project that also ran in Node, right? So, but not, you know, not a cool browser testing tool, but it does run in a Node environment. And I remember like, when teams were switching from Mocha to Ava, like they, not only did they get the speed gains, but all of a sudden a bunch of new flaky tests appeared out of nowhere. And it was because, you know, their tests weren't sandboxed and they were kind of relying on the state of the previous test. <laughs> so, yeah. so the fact that like, it's so cool to parallelize and force that kind of sandboxing, but I think what a cool problem to solve for browser tests, because I think that's like a very unique feature in order to run things in parallel like that, you need to have a bunch of very fancy setup in your CI. And it just feels like Playwright kind of smoothed it, you know. I'm going to jump in here. Yeah. And say the word test isolation. Okay. Test isolation. Yeah. So isolating your tests this, means this that This thing like, that I'm describing in many words. Yeah. Is. It's kind of like you're trying to get the word out, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. it's basically like 
how would I, I had explained it is if you think of an incognito browser window, right? Mm -hmm. When you open that incognito window, you get no links are kind of coming over from a previous window, right? Everything is fresh. Everything is new. And that's kind of basically how you can imagine it, right? Mm -hmm. So everything is isolated, which means that when you run those tests, nothing leaks, no state leaks from one test to the other, which makes your tests less flaky. You don't have to clean up after the test because a new browser, new test isolation, new browser context is created every time you're running your test. And it's super cheap to do it. It doesn't like, it's not like this is a really expensive process, right? Hmm. So, which is how it's made really fast. But yeah, it means if you want to share something across a lot of tests, you can do that with fixtures and, you know, page object model is another one, for example, that people know of, but say fixtures, which is what we recommend, then you can kind of, you know, say, right, use state in this tree tests, right? But it's using it each time as opposed to, okay, here's my test and I want, I want you to use test A's, no, no, test A and test B are two different tests running completely different and don't talk to each other ever. Right. And I love that because state is like the hugest, did I just make up a word? It is the hugest source of <laughs> test, like flakiness, right? In general, like yeah. state issues in your tests that they just cause flake. And there's lots of different kinds of state, like even just like you thinking the DOM is ready when it's not, or you thinking that this image is loaded, but it's not, or whatever it is, right? There's so ah, much. Yes. See, and that's where auto-waiting comes in. Yeah, I know. Tell us about auto-waiting, Debbie. <laughs> yeah, so Playwright will auto-wait for something to be ready on the DOM. So you don't have to think or calculate, oh, this needs three seconds to be able to be clickable, right? Playwright <laughs> is just going to wait. It's going to do all that for you. So you don't have to worry about that. Now, obviously, <laughs> if you have something that's going to take 10 seconds to, to be clickable, then you have a problem in your code and playwright test is not going to wait that long and it's going <laughs> to say... your user experience, I would say. <laughs> exactly. So now it's time to fix your code, not your test, right? You got it. But you could manually put a timeout if you felt you need it for whatever reason until the code maybe is fixed. You know, you could do that. But in general, playwright will wait for everything. You don't have to set timeouts. It gets done for you. And that makes it really easy because you just have to concentrate on writing a test and not having to think about all the setup. This is encroaching on my trademark sleep method that I add to every test. <laughs> Nick's like, if, it, if I ain't sleeping, yeah. it ain't sleeping. You know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, this is really great. And there's a lot of cool things. One thing I wanted to ask about, though, because I I was kind of fibbing when I said that a manual test is, is the only way to go or the only way I've gone. I couldn't tell you were fibbing, Nick. I know. <laughs> I have like a Dear Nick letter that I'm writing to you. <laughs> Dear Nick. <laughs> I'm somewhat old school in that I have been around long enough that I was using other tools like this that were specifically like using, I think it was called like, well, Selenium, but I think a web driver was the, the underlying like API or whatever. And I'm curious, is Playwright built on top of that? legacy or is it kind of doing something different to orchestrate these browsers it's doing something different it's using the chrome protocol i don't know too much about it. i couldn't go too deep into that but yeah it's not using web driver it's using the chrome protocol instead okay um if you know about those you'll know the difference and <laughs> don't <laughs> yeah it's <laughs> so <that's> okay <laughs> like it does support more than just chromium browsers too that's an important thing to highlight exactly so it, like all browsers webkit chromium and um, even Opera, etc. So it can run in all browsers, which is basically what you want to do. Yeah. So yeah, it uses the Chrome protocol to be able to do that, if that makes sense. Coming from that legacy and hearing that it doesn't use Selenium is like a breath of fresh air. It's like, wow, it might actually be stable and, and work really well. <laughs> yeah, no, you can't like use, no, that wouldn't be good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're going to get into all this other good stuff with features and I'm super eager to kind of, you just dropped a big bombshell, Debbie, which is like multi-browser support and you know, we can't just, we can't open that can of worms without mm -hmm. going deep. So I'm going to just leave that, leave that for the second segment. So we'll be right back everyone This episode is brought to you by Sentry. Build better software faster, diagnose, fix, and optimize the performance of your code. More than a million developers in 68,000 organizations already use Sentry, and that includes us. Here's the easiest way to try Sentry. 
and that's Sentry.io slash demo slash sandbox. That is a fully functional version of Sentry that you can poke at. And best of all, our listeners get the team plan for free for three months at the Sentry.io and use the code PARTYTIME when you sign up. Again, Sentry.io and use the code PARTYTIME. So Debbie, you mentioned that Playwright supports multiple browsers. I thought that'd be a good place to to dive right in in the new segment. So do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I guess you could say very, very easily in, say you're using in your config file, right? Mm -hmm. In Playwright, you can literally just, it's actually like there. You just have to uncomment out the other browsers, right? And if you're using the VS Code extension, which I haven't even told you about, but from the VS Code extension, it asks you which browsers you want to install and you just select the browsers. Playwright will then install those browsers for you. So you don't even have to have these browsers like on your computer, right? You've now got these browsers and Playwright will run the tests on all those browsers that you have decided you want to run them on. So if you're having problems on, let's just say Safari, because sometimes people have problems (laughs) with Safari. (laughs) That means that when you go to production, without having to do any extra work, your test is going to run across all those browsers and you're going to find those Safari bugs before you go to production, you're going to be able to fix it. It could be a tiny little CSS issue, normally is a CSS issue. And then you (laughs) fix that and it's going to work in Safari and all your users are going to be happy, right? So yeah, as well as, you know, mobile, you can test across mobile responsiveness, make sure everything works on those emulated devices as well. Mm -hmm. So just being able to spin up any browser without any effort, without actually doing anything, without opening another website or tool, you just literally, it just works. Yeah. It's just easy. Does it support branching within those browsers? So like if I'm writing a test on some specific feature, let's take Riverside, for example, because this is <laughs> this is the app we're using to record this podcast. Yeah. And if I were to run the test across all browsers, when I get to probably 99% of the tests in Safari, it would pop up a message that says this works best in Chrome or, <laughs> or Edge or like some message like that. Yeah. And so like, is there like a way to be like in Safari or skip these tests if Safari or something like that? (laughs) So there actually is, believe it or not. Nice. So for example, say I'm going to give you an easier example so you can kind of picture it. And a lot of users can picture this. You take navigation. You want to test the navigation menu of your website. Yeah. Right. And then you want to test it on a mobile device. The mobile device has a hamburger menu on most websites. So now it's a little bit different. The user experience is different because what does the user have to do? They have to click this hamburger menu and then they can click the about page. Then on the about page, they want to go to the menu again. They have to click the hamburger menu again and then they click the features or whatever page they want to go to next, right? Yeah. So when you write that test, previously you might have written two tests, right? One and say, you know, use mobile and the other use kind of desktop kind of thing. But you don't need to do that. You can write one test and you can use the is mobile right? So you can say if it's, you just pass it in as in, you know, when you're writing your test, you'll have a page, Uh, you can write in page and then comma is mobile. And then you put that in. If it's mobile, click hamburger menu, and then you'll go into the next, whatever it is, click on the, uh, the about page. And then if it's mobile again, click hamburger and then click on the features page. And you can do that with kind of other things as well. So once we kind of know what you're using, what, you know, what device, what, et cetera, then you can kind of, you know, test it in. So I've never done that if it's Safari, yeah. but I'm almost sure you can do that because you can do is mobile. So I'm imagining you can do the, the same thing there. So that's what I would suggest to do. Yeah. Yeah. And you have full access to the entire browser, right? Or the, or to like the, the JavaScript global namespace for that instance, right? So you could probably check something. The user agent. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You can check the user agent. Exactly. Yeah. So just so I understand this, there's still limitations for OS, I would imagine, right? For example, if you're on a Windows computer, would you still be able to launch a Safari instance? Like, I guess, I don't know. I'm a, this is a question, genuine question, so I'm, I'm of course curious. You, can. you can't. What do you mean? Oh, my God. Of course yeah, you can. It's, it's, this is amazing. What? You just blew me away. Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Please explain this black magic, uh, Debbie. <laughs> 
I mean, Playwright installs those browsers for you. So it spins up an instance of those browsers. So it's got everything it needs. I mean, think about it. Your tests need to run on CI, mm -hmm. right? So how are they going to run on CI? So you're able to run up in like headless mode on CI. So you're able to run any browser from anywhere. So it doesn't matter what system you're using, you can spin up a Safari browser and run the tests across Safari and any other browser, not just Safari has the problems. <laughs> wow. What about Edge? I didn't even think of that, but... I know, mind blown, right, Nick? <laughs> Yeah, so Edge runs on Chromium. So Edge and Chrome both run on Chromium. And Safari runs on WebKit. So it's, it's running up an instance of WebKit, which is, you know, the Safari browser. The engine, basically, that is used. Yeah. Remember old Edge, non-Edge HTML, like, or maybe it was HTML, now I'm getting confused. But the version of Edge before it was Chromium, like, I mean, granted, like, I think that whole browser is more or less deprecated at this point. But I mean, I'm sure it's still in use. And so would you be able to test on a old edge or an IE, <laughs> is that possible? Or is it specifically strictly for modern browsers? I have no idea. I've never had to deal with that problem. Yeah, I'm jealous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we just dropped support for IE 11 in June when IE 11 officially died. And so. Yes. No, it's strict. It's probably yeah. strictly modern, which makes sense, right? Like. Let's not resurrect the dead. Yeah. yeah I know. But, you know, people, <laughs> you know, you'd be surprised government, people that just had to support governments, you know, believe it or not, like the testing surface mm -hmm. is still a little wider. <laughs> <laughs> but that being said, this is a really powerful kind of superpower because like being able to easily test across multiple browsers, you know, and having kind of that parallelization set up kind of turnkey out of the box, like that's really solving a huge pain point for developers, Debbie. It's like tremendously exciting. And you don't have to have those browsers downloaded on your computer. Correct. Stuff, right. right. So like say Firefox and there's nothing against Firefox. I just don't use it. It's amazing, right. but I don't use it, right? So I don't have Firefox, but I test across Firefox and I have no Firefox on my machine at all. Yeah. So it's kind of cool. You don't have to like, I'm going to download all these browsers and then open each one and then, you know. <laughs> right. But like, but in terms of debugging, what's your debugging story like for if you, you know, you don't have Firefox downloaded, but it's, you know, you have Firefox being tested Playwright and you have an issue with Firefox. So what's the debugging story? At that point, do you have to go and download Firefox or can you use the instance that Playwright creates to debug? Yeah, you don't need to download that browser on your computer to be able to debug because you don't need to. You can debug straight in the actual browser that's, you know, there's a couple of ways of debugging. So I use the VS Code extension, which is absolutely amazing. So from the VS Code extension, I can actually debug that test. I can open that test and I can set a breakpoint in VS Code itself. And then I can step through it and I can see what's going on, where the error is, and then like debug it right there and then. Maybe fix that code, whatever it is, small CSS issue it could be or whatever, or JavaScript undefined, something, I don't know. Fix it and then rerun that test again, open it up. It'll show me if I want to, I can press show browser so I can visually see it open up Firefox. I can say like, I only want to debug in Firefox because maybe it's passing on the others. So I don't want to waste time running the others. I'm focusing on this one. So I'll say only Firefox, let's run debug mode and let's debug that. Okay, then that works. And then I can rerun all the tests in all browsers again to double make sure. But as you're running it with show browser, you can see the different browsers coming up and you know the difference between WebKit, Chromium and Firefox. You can visually see it and you, you know, you know which one is, uh, that you're watching going through it. But yeah, you can also use the terminal and you can use the debug commands as well if you don't want to use the VS Code extension for whatever reason. Maybe you're just a terminal person or or maybe you're using a different editor, right? There's a couple of different options of debugging, so it's kind of cool. Yeah, super cool. And that really highlights like a really important point and perk of something like Playwright because I'll tell you, like we have a lot of React tests in our app, right? And for a majority of them, we're using Jest plus React testing library, which is kind of giving us this like test from the user's perspective thing. You know, you have a screen object and you can get by ID and all, all, all this to find like how it's actually rendered, but it's not rendered in a browser. It's rendered with JS DOM. And so it's not like a real environment. It's not often, but things do arise that are not actually happening or happening in 
JS DOM and not happening in an actual browser. And then when we go to debug it, which is quite often, <laughs> it's like the only thing that we have is screen.debug, which spits out a bunch of HTML and it's like, well, figure it out from there. Yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, with auto generated classes and stuff, it's like, what is going on half the time? Whereas like Playwright gives you this amazing ability to test in the actual environments. And when things go wrong and you need to like be like, why is not I'm trying to click this button? Well, you can spin it up in that instance, like actually see it run and oh, immediately see that button's disabled. That's why it's not clicking or something like that. Like it's just so easy and, and so much more practical to do that. So it's a big benefit of like a, why we're looking at moving over to this because it that would just save so much time. <laughs> Yeah, and you're talking about a real click as opposed to an emulated click, exactly. right? And that's a little bit different to actually a real click happening and a kind of fake environmental kind of emulated click, right? Yeah. So they can behave a little bit different. Precisely. One thing you also mentioned there was testing library, right? Uh-huh. And I know there's a lot of people out there, big fans of testing library. I used to use testing library as well. Did you know, did you watch their last latest release video where we worked with Kent C. Dodds to bring in testing library inspired API so that we can have that same kind of testing library feel of get by role, get by test ID, get by head, get by title, get by alt, etc. No, I did not know this. There you go. <laughs> that makes converting so much easier. Yeah, this is starting to sound like an <laughs> yeah. It's like an infomercial for um, <laughs> libraries, you know, and, and open source libraries. This is like, did you know? Uh, no, I didn't. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. You know? And so infomercial continuing here. First of all, I'm just kind of amazed at the words that you just said, Debbie. That was genuine, though. It was. It was, of course. All of this is genuine. No, Debbie, hold on. Did you just say, did you watch the video of the release? I'm like, damn, like... Open source libraries are coming out with videos now when they really, that's like taking it to another level. Playwright <laughs> is, of course it okay. is. Yes, every month we we create a video every single month. Every, there's a release every month yeah. and we'll create a video and show you the new features and everything that's new. That's cool. So if you're trying to like keep up of the changes. Just watch the video. You can just watch the short video. And we tr do try and keep it short. Yeah. The guys will go through it and tell you like, this is what's changed. This is what's new. This is what we recommend. This is the best practice. And then you can just watch that and then you go, oh my God, I need to change my code. I need to do this. Or, oh, that's a really cool feature. I didn't know I could use. Now I can use it. Or maybe there's nothing new that you particularly, you know, are interested in. But like there's a ton of features all the time. So it's kind of really cool to watch those videos and keep up to date with the changes. Yeah. Because the latest changes, like the um, the testing library inspired API, this is going to help you write better code because now you're accessibility first. And Playwright is going to, and we haven't even gone into the other tools yeah. that I'll mention in a second, which is like the generator and the VS Code extension for choosing the right locator. So if you don't know which locator to use because you're new to testing and you're like, what do I use? Do I use like get by what? Get by role, get by heading, get by test study, get what do I use, right? So the selector is going to pick it for you. So you just have to click and hover over the page and it's going to take that and it's going to give it to you and you, you know, okay, this is a get by role link. The name is about, and then it's, you copy that into your test, right? Rather than trying to think, oh, I need to write my test and I have no idea what to do. And then if you kind of get one that says get by role, and maybe it's a CSS selector. I don't think even we will give that to you, but say you had that, that's a kind of really bad selector, right? So something is missing in your code. Maybe your code is not accessible. So now you need to improve your code to try and actually give an accessible role to something so that the code is better. The test is going to now help you write better code. So that's kind of like the cool thing, I think, about the new changes to the the new API that came out in the latest. Selectors, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, in the latest release. And what number is that? 1.27. So that's really cool. And yeah. I'm curious, like this kind of the multi-browser support, this force, the kind of accessibility sanity checks, right? Making sure that you're like by your code being accessible to the test, it's also accessible to a user that may be, you know, using a screen reading device, right? So that's like incredibly awesome. What are your other favorite bits of magic, Debbie? Because it seems like from listening to you for the past however many minutes like it really does seem like playwright has kind of taken some of those very common problems that developers face when writing browser tests and really how do we kind of smooth over that pain All right so you mentioned some vs code integration and some other things like so can you kind of talk about some of your favorite things i know there's too many to cover in this podcast but we'll just yeah pick your favorites 
Okay, I want to speak about two. So let's try and I'm going to put it in half and then you're going to go, tell me about the next one, right? Okay, okay, yes, yes. So I'm going to stay on the first one and then when you're ready for the second one, you go, I want the next one now. (laughs) All right, all right, all right. I love it. It's a first in, first out cue. (laughs) Yeah, but before I even go in the first in and the first out, just remember the VS Code extension is going to make your life a lot easier when you're getting started because now you're right inside VS Code. You get a little green button with a triangle. You press play, that runs your test for you. So you don't have to open terminal at any stage to write your test, run your test, debug your test. Oh, wow. So now the question is, how am I going to write my tests? That makes it friendly for many people. Yes, exactly. So now the writing of tests, because that's the hard bit, isn't it? It's like, I don't know where to start, right? Right, right. I'm new to testing. I don't know what to do. I don't know which locator, selectors, et cetera, to use. How do I actually get a test written? And this is where CodeGen comes in. So CodeGen is a test generator. And again, you can use the terminal if you want, and you can just npx player at CodeGen, or right in the VS Code, you can just click the button that says to record a test. And when you click that button to record a test, it's going to open up in your VS Code, it's going to open up a new test file, and it's already have started the test for you, and it's going to open up a browser window. Now inside that browser window, you can write in the browser, whatever page you want to go to, um, JS party, and that's going to go to that page. So now we're on that page and your test has started to, to visualize that you can see go to page, etc. Now I want to click on the, I don't know, the about link. So I click on the about link and then it's going to go get by role link name about dot click. That's going to be written for you. And now I'm on the about page and say, maybe I want to test that the heading is there. So get by role heading, um, name, Yes, party, whatever. And then go down and check each kind of thing. Maybe you want to check that the image is there. You could get my alt text. And you can just click. As you're clicking along, it's going to write that test for you. So you have done no work. You have not written any code. All you've done is be a user and you have clicked on the page to listen to this podcast, press the play button and... um, Make sure that play button is there, for example. And then you go to your test. Now you've got a full test written, and then you can press play and play back that test, visually see it by clicking on the show browser. And now you can see that that test works. Now, you will have to go and change a little bit of code because you don't have the web first assertions, right? So it's click kind of methods. But say you clicked on, I said we're going to click on the title, which is get by role heading, name JS party. So now you kind of want to change that and say, expect get by role heading name JS party to be visible, right? So that's the little modification now that you need to do because we at the moment do not generate assertions. We generate user actions like clicks and fill and type and etc. right? But if you do click on it, it's going to go into your code and then you can just modify it. So it makes it a, a lot easier because you don't have to worry about how do I get started? Yeah, yeah. That is so cool. I love that experience as well, because you would think a feature like this, it would be used by people who maybe aren't developers. But actually, this is assistive to developers that just want to get a foundation that they can modify, right? So you're like, where do I start? How do I structure this test? What's the user flow? Here's a rudimentary version that you can then improve. Like, I love that workflow, Debbie. Like, that's a really cool workflow, especially like, you know, if it's a Friday afternoon and I'm like, you know, three hours before the weekend and I got to write this test, you know, (laughs) sometimes you just need a little... You need a little bit of of a push or a little bit of a cheat, right? But this is like a cheat in a good way. (laughs) Yeah, it's like I literally say to people, it's going to take you five minutes to install Playwright and write your first test and have it running. And yeah. This is not even me telling you the second feature. This is me just jumping ahead. Oh my God, I know, I know. Include in that five minutes. (laughs) You can then run your test on a GitHub Action workflow because that comes out of the box included when you're installing. So now you've got a GitHub Actions workflow running. So you literally just push your code to GitHub. And now on every PR, your test is going to run for you. And you don't have to do anything to set that up. It just works. That's so cool. That's, yeah. That's like the beauty of an integrated platform, you know, is that you can like really smooth over those, like you can preemptively kind of give your users like a better like integration with all your suite of tools, you know? And so that's the like very cool integration between VS Code, GitHub Actions, Playwright, and GitHub itself, right? (laughs) So, I mean, you know, GitHub Actions is a feature on GitHub, but y'all get the point. Yeah. And TypeScript, because it's TypeScript first. (laughs) Yeah. 
<laughs> that too, yes. No fiddling with config files. That's awesome. You just said Nick yeah. Nisi's buzzwords, so uh, you know mm -hmm. we've pretty much lost him for <laughs> another five minutes. He'll be daydreaming about TypeScript. No, but Debbie, so much to get into. I'm excited to hear about the second thing and and more. I'm also okay. I've got to ask about Cypress, right? Our listeners are going to be like, well, what about Cypress? You know, and so we will have to ask you to kind of summarize for us what Playwright has that Cypress doesn't so that folks can kind of wrap their head around the Delta a little easier. And yeah, so we'll get into all of that and more after these short messages. I'm Gerhard Zhu, host of Ship It, a show with weekly episodes about getting your best ideas into the world and seeing what happens. We talk about code, ops, infrastructure, and the people that make it happen, like charity majors from Honeycomb. We act like great engineers make great teams, but it's exactly the opposite, in fact. It is great teams that make great engineers. And they farly when the founders of Continuous Delivery. Start off assuming that we're wrong rather than assuming that we're right. Test our ideas, try and falsify our ideas. Those are better ways of doing work. And it doesn't really matter what work it is that you're doing. That stuff just works better. We even experiment on our own open source podcasting platform so that you can see how we implement specific tools and services within changelog.com, what works and what fails. It's like there's a brand new hammer and we grab hold of it and everyone gathers around. We put our hand out and we <laughs> we strike it right on our thumb. And then everybody knows that hammer really hurts when you strike it on your thumb. I'm glad those guys did it. I've learned something <laughs> instead. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting perspective, but <laughs> I, I don't see that way. OK, it's an amazing analogy, but I'm not sure that applies here. Listen to an episode that seems interesting or helpful. And if you like it, subscribe today. We'd love to have you with us. Okay, Debbie, that was quite the cliffhanger that you left us with. You know, you was like, we were running through your list of favorite things and there's too many to cover in this podcast. So we're, we're kind of <laughs> letting you drive, drive us down your list. So let's get back into it. We talked about multi-browser support. We talked about kind of approved selectors, accessibility, kind of, um, improvements that usher good decision making, all this kind of cool new features. Can you tell us about more of your favorite things? Okay, so let me give you an example, right? So you run your test on continuous integration with GitHub Actions or whatever. I'm saying GitHub Actions, but actually it integrates with everything else. You just have to, you know, add that config file yourself, but GitHub Actions is out of the box, but it runs on every other CI as well. So you're running your test in CI and it fails in CI. It runs locally. It fails in CI. So now you're like stuck. What do you do? What would you do in this instant? How would you fix that test? Like, I mean, I'd have to kind of like find the test locally and I have to run it, grep, do a lot of grepping. Mm -hmm. But it works locally. I don't know. I'd have to look at the combination of like the matrix to see which permutation in CI does it fail. And then how do I reproduce that locally? I don't know. It's tough. I would start adding sleeps. <laughs> Time out everywhere. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's a good Console one. Console log everywhere. <laughs> So this is why my other feature is very cool and it's called a trace viewer. So you can run the traces, actually run automatically without you having to set up anything. Traces will run on the first retry. So when your test runs the first time it fails, Playwright will run it again and say, maybe there was something up there. Let's run it again, see what happens. It fails again. Now it's gonna go, okay, I'm gonna create a trace for you of your whole test. So now you have this trace and what is a trace? It's basically, a PWA of your whole test, right? And you download this as a zip file. Now you run this PWA, so it's now a little mini application running that you can actually step through. So if you're thinking of the Chrome DevTools, you have the timeline at the top, right? So you've got a timeline of your test you can go through and it shows a little kind of screenshot image of every step of the test, everything that happened with all the events at the top, like in different colors, a click event, a fill event, etc. Then on one side, you have everything, every single event that happened, every click event or every whatever you did in that test. And you can click on each one and now it's going to open in the middle a box and that box is going to have, it's a DOM snapshot. So now it's not an image snapshot, it's a DOM snapshot of each moment of your test. Now that DOM snapshot 
because it's a DOM, it means you can open Chrome DevTools or whatever DevTools you're running. And uh, you can open that up and you can literally like see what's going on, see the CSS, and you can actually like picture and kind of play around with it and kind of almost fix it, right? But then you also have on the other side, the console log, the network requests, plus the actual test file. So you can even see the test code without even having to open up your editor. You could send that to someone and they could literally kind of go through it and say, oh, look, this failed because the mobile view is, it's out of viewport. So the test has failed because the menu is there, but it's out of viewport and it can't. The test doesn't have a handling for mobile. Yeah. Exactly. But you can visually now see this. And that was kind of like an easy one to kind of see, but you can actually see it. So it's much better. Now you can still record a video if you want to. So people ask us, oh, we want to record videos. Go ahead. If you want to record videos, they're really heavy. They're kind of like, you're just going to play a video. But why not have something that you can interact with and actually open the dev tools and like really play around with? Because that's much, much more better than just a video, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the Trace Viewer. It runs, as I said, on CI on the first retry, but you could also actually run it locally. So if you are kind of going through something that you can't figure out and you're debugging it and you're getting really frustrated, you can actually put the, the tag dash dash trace on. And then when your test fails, you can show the report. You know, you're going to get a full report and you get the trace at the bottom and you click on that trace. And now you can actually open that up and you can walk through and step through your test and see Ah, I see what I was doing wrong. I was testing for this, but I really should have done that or whatever. That is awesome. That's super cool. <laughs> I was going to just ask him, like, is this, does it do this for every test? But no, it's, there's a flag that you have to turn on, but that's great because then you get that, ex, that rich, extra richness only when you need it. Yeah, because you only want if your test fails. Yeah. And do you know if the, like, the things line up visually so that, like, it, shows you here's the traces that we're collecting and here's the assertions but and so you know that like everything is green until you get to these sets of traces where things start to go haywire like do those things line up is there is there like a timeline where you can see so it'll kind of like go through everything and then it'll say here playwright stopped here and this is where it broke so this is where Uh to this point but then you can see what happened and what happened before it to cause that and maybe it was a network request So maybe your test failed because the API is down, but you will see that API request information and you'll be able to go, ah, we have a problem with the API. Because maybe when you test it locally, it ran, everything worked, the API then dropped, and then you ran it on CI and then it kind of failed, right? So you'll be able to see in through the console log, the network requests, and that's kind of like what makes it powerful. That's something you don't get in a video, right? You don't get that information. No, you don't. You've taken the video and kind of flip inverted it. What we're getting is a video of like what's happening underneath. (laughs) Under the hood, you know, what's happening below the surface of the iceberg, which is really how developers can make an educated guess towards, like, that's how we come into the picture in in terms of fixing it, right? And so I'm like, kind of mind blown by this, because I can see teams building a whole workflow around this, where they have uh, the traces automatically get generated and maybe published and sent somewhere and analyzed and like, and you can even parse the traces if you really want to. And like, you can build a robust workflow around reporting failures and flakiness, you know, for companies like, you know, where I work, where that type of flakiness and reporting is actually like a really big deal, you know, like we like have whole systems that like track flaky tests and like when they started to fail and why and you know so that's really really if I feel like for me that feature alone is like worth its weight in gold so that's very cool yeah and the idea is that like you should have less flaky tests so you should absolutely almost never really need this feature because it's literally only gonna (laughs) only gonna be needed if you're like really struggling because something went wrong right yeah that makes sense. And so in terms of kind of like running your tests, right? Like what's the recommended kind of best practice for CI, uh, right? Like for teams that have to maintain lots and lots and lots of tests. Is there like, is there some setup or config that's recommended or do you all kind of let teams do whatever they want to do? I'm curious if there's any just guidance from your team on that. I mean, obviously, like I will say, you know, use GitHub, use Azure because, you know, but every team has already got their CI set up with whatever they've got to set up with. So you don't have to leave your CI environment and now change that just because we will give you GitHub Actions out of the box because you know we're integrated with them. It makes sense, right? But we have documentation for the other CI. So you just go to that documentation page and take that configuration 
example and put it into your configuration of your CI and then you'll have that running on whatever it is you're 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 using. So there's not really like we recommend this or like, I mean, I'll say, yeah, we recommend GitHub. Of course we do. But we understand that the world is not all on GitHub Actions and GitHub and, you know, or Azure. So it's totally fine. Playwright is open source, so you can use it on whatever you want. Yeah, all you other clouds can still exist. <laughs> Just kidding. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's room for everybody. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And so we have to kind of bring up the elephant in the room, you know, but really didn't want to make this show about how playwright is not Cypress, right? You know, so we're at the Towards the end of the show, I kind of want to ask just if you can kind of give us a highlight of summary highlight of how Playwright is different than Cypress, right? For many folks like myself, who I've been a longtime Cypress user, um, it's a tool that I know, it's a tool that I've used at multiple companies, you know, et cetera. And so what's the kind of, you know, folks are curious about Playwright? Why should they be more curious? And more specifically, like, what does Playwright have that Cypress doesn't? that'll make things easier for our users. Okay, so yeah, Cypress is great. I used to use Cypress for many years, so I come from that world as well. We are newer, so therefore the community is smaller, which is my job to grow the community. So Playwright's been around for about two and a half years now. So obviously like we do not have as much workshops out there and examples and videos and stuff, which we are working on, we will have. And thanks to our ambassador page, you'll, you'll be able to find kind of more content there if that's what you're looking for. When it comes to kind of differences, I guess like browser support, and I know that Cypress has recently added WebKit support because they're using the um, Playwright WebKit to be able to get that. So they're kind of a little bit on par, I guess, when it comes to the browser testing, thanks to (laughs) our open source work, of course. Then there's other things like multi-language, right? So this is something that I think is very important if you're working with a team of many developers who work in different languages. Mm-hmm. So you can use Playwright in you know, JavaScript, TypeScript, or you can use Playwright in um, .NET, or you can use Playwright in Java or in Python. So you now have a team, and maybe, Nick, you're a Python developer, and Amal, you're a, a C-sharp developer, and I'm TypeScript. So now we have different applications because companies have different applications and you want to write the test and the code that you're comfortable with. So you write your test. We all write different tests in our all different languages, but we have the same library, the same API, the same, everything works the same. So if I read your test, I would understand it. Just the syntax is a little different. So I, I might struggle kind of, you know, writing certain syntax, but I, I could read your test and understand it. You could read my test, Nick, and understand it. And I think that makes it really important that you have one one workflow, one way of doing things, one library that people are just, you just have to learn Playwright and now you can work across the stack. Exactly. And having that is, you know, rather than one on one, another, another, and now you've got all these problems and the front end is doing this and the, you know, the backend developers are doing that and it's like a mess. So that's the first thing I would say is I think really important is the multi-language support. Mm -hmm. Another thing that Playwright does really, really well that I know other frameworks have struggled with is being able to test across multiple domains. So imagine a chat application that opens up two browser windows and you need to be able to write in the chat and then go to the next window and answer back and go to the, you can actually do that in Playwright, just works. You don't have to set up anything, it just works. Another thing is iframes, right? If you want to test an iframe, maybe there's a YouTube video on your website you want to test, for example, or whatever iframe, Netflix has a chat application in in theirs, which is set up through an iframe, right? You want to be able to go into that iframe and test that. That just works. You don't have to do anything. It just uses the frame locator instead of the page locator. So yeah, that basically works out of the box. And then obviously parallelism for free. So you don't have to pay for anything. It just works, which means your tests run a lot faster. I know some uh, charge you for parallelism. That's why I say free because you don't have to pay. (laughs) Some make you pay. And then let me think, obviously the trace view or the tooling around it, which kind of just means... You know, if you're using kind of things like, say, VS Code, that all the integration that goes on, you know, makes a very good developer experience. But then you got the trace viewer for when you're kind of having problems and trying to debug, etc. And I don't even know any of the like, there could be other differences out there. But I would say like, maybe if you're having problems testing across multiple domains, testing across iframes, if your tests are running slow, or if you have flaky tests because of test cleanup, etc., then Playwrights just solved all those problems for you. 
because it just works, right? I like to say playwright just works. Just you don't have to do anything. It just works. <laughs> That's really great. And that was a really great summary and rundown, Debbie. Thank you so much for that. Yeah. Disclaimer for the open source projects or the non megacorp supported projects, right? Parallelization being something that maybe companies like Cypress charge for, like that's, you know, obviously a lot of the work that Playwright does is subsidized by a quite of a large corporation. And so for smaller companies, you know, that is their, that is their one path to getting funding and or supporting their staff. So definitely don't want to like, Open source projects by large companies are great, but they do subsidize a lot of really great things. And we all get to benefit from that subsidization, obviously, as a community. But I just wanted to sh- say that, like, no shame in Cypress's game, right? <laughs> so, no, for sure. And for to be sure. fair, and I, I don't think you meant that at all. I just, to be clear, I'm just, I'm just reiterating that myself. But I'm amazed. I'm personally very excited to check out Playwright. I think it's always really refreshing to hear about tools like this that are really evolving where the community is, right? We, the community is now generally at this bar. And so now projects like Playwright are kind of coming in and elevating the bar even further, right? Yeah. To kind of say, okay, we've all started to understand how important end-to-end tests are and browser tests are and integration tests that are run via a browser, right? All those things are different, but all of those things can be used by these same tools. And now we kind of are collectively norming around certain things. And so we're collectively solving our problems and further creating better and better abstractions. And so I feel like Playwright is really in that evolution. It seems like at this point, maybe even best in class in terms of certain user experiences. So very excited to check it out. And and thank you so much for spending time with us today. I mean, Nick, wasn't this cool? It was. And yeah, I mean, just to reiterate what you were saying, like, this is solving problems that maybe you didn't know that you had, like, and making things so much easier because testing UI is hard. And we have great tools. Used to be hard. Used to be hard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it gets easier with tools like this, exactly. Because it, I love that. Debbie's like, it used to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it really lets you test, you know, in the environments that these are actually running in. And we've had like lots of ways to to do that over the past. But like I've used Playwright and this class of tooling just seems like the most stable by far. And, you know, you get consistently good results from it. Like back in, you know, 10 years ago when I was trying to do this stuff, you know, when these tests would fail, it was like, okay, did they actually fail? Or was it just like the the tooling? Did that just like crap out? And that doesn't seem to be the case anymore with these tools. And so it's just so good to see this being pushed forward. And I hope that this and, and tools like it get lots of widespread adoption because it is really the best way to test UI because you're doing it in the place where the UI runs. So thank you for making this tool. Absolutely. Yeah, well, I didn't make it, so I won't take all the credit. But uh, <laughs> you and your team. Yeah. This is the royal you, the royal you of the playwright team. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, the royal you. But yes, we have an amazing team behind it. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And also the community, and I want to kind of say as well, playwright is very community driven. We are open source. Yes, we are like Microsoft, but we are open source, which means that we rely on the community here to file issues, tell us about, you know, problems that they're having, features that they're requesting, upvoting it so that we know that this is what the community wants us to do. This is where we should, you know, kind of like put our efforts and stuff. And also like, there's been a couple of people who've contributed as well and, you know, helped us out, which has been great as well. So yeah, the community is everything to us. And the more people that become part of this community, the more amazing the tool is going to be. So I would say everyone come and be part of the community. Yeah. And star us on GitHub. (laughs) Right, right. So if people do want to get involved, Debbie, and learn more about the project and learn about you, what are some good resources for them? And then also, are there any kind of workshops online or any free videos or like, what's the best way for someone to kind of just get started and start learning? Yeah, so playwright.dev is the website and it's got the get started section, which will take you through writing your tests in five minutes. You let everything up and running. Then if you want to know more, there's a whole community page and you can go there. It will tell you about, you know, contributing. It will also give you videos that release videos that I was talking about. There's a section of release videos. There's conference talks. If you want to just listen to me all day long, you could totally do that talking about Playwright. So there's loads of kind of videos there. And then there's some live streams are in there as well. We will be building more kind of, you know, upcoming, like not workshop, but like small learn how to do this kind of thing that will be coming so follow the youtube channel for that follow twitter i know there's been a bit of kind of 
going on these days but yeah follow twitter for kind of any like new release information that's coming out or linkedin we're on there as well and then the watch the release video right Mm -hmm. it feels like that's a good learning tool there's a new one coming soon yeah yeah and there's a new one coming soon so check check that out (laughs) okay one dot Two seven. Two eight. Two eight's coming. One dot two eight. Two eight. Two eight. Oh my god. Two seven is out, and two eight's coming. So you know you got to keep up with us. You know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Oh my god. And we'll have links to all this in the show notes. Yeah, we'll put links to everything. All right, Debbie. So last question for you before we wrap: If you could have one feature or wave a magic wand that's playwright related, what would be your wish? I want it to generate the assertions for me so I don't have to manually change those clicks into assertions. So I want it to know that if it's a title, nobody's going to click on that title. So make it to be visible. If then I want it to be something else, I can edit that later. But that's kind of like almost 90% of the time, I just want something to be visible on the page. And if it's not clickable, I want it to just automatically be visible. Yeah, that's my number one. That's a solid number one. I mean, yeah. And that's also very meta, right? Because you just went from, you're like, oh, automate it for me. Don't make me manually yeah, do it. Yeah, make my life easier. Yeah, right? yeah. I want to go do sports. I don't want to be sitting editing stuff. <laughs> Playwright for president. You know, you heard it here first, everybody. Yeah. Again, Debbie O'Brien, it's been an absolute <laughs> pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on the show. We'll be back next week with even more good stuff. I'm not going to spoil the surprise to so y'all just to listen, but got a great show next week as well so see you all everyone take care bye-bye it's been fun bye this episode about playwright was a listener request shout out to Cap emerald for the idea he wrote to us saying quote End-to-end is one of the most important tools in testing, but it has always had the problem of being expensive to run and maintain. Tools like Playwright and Cypress aim to make this simpler. Since Cypress is now using Playwright to implement its WebKit support, it would be really nice to get to know Playwright a little bit more." End quote. He also told us we can pronounce his name like Kyle from South Park. My name is not Kyle. I hope we did it justice for you, Kyle. Special thanks to our partners Fastly and Fly.io for helping us bring you JS Party each week to the best beat freak a guy could hope for, Breakmaster Cylinder. And of course, thank you for listening. We appreciate you hanging out with us. That's all for now, but we'll party again real soon. Music